Hi, this is the Kevin Bass Show. In this podcast, I'm going to be discussing the latest new trends, investigations, discoveries, and controversies in the fields of health, health science, nutrition, fitness, and medicine. I am both endlessly overjoyed by the discovery of new knowledge and incredibly happy to share it with you, but also relentlessly critical of anything that is unlikely to pan out or unlikely to be true or useful. Through this dynamic interplay, I make this podcast one of the most intellectually exciting and vibrant among any in this space, both tremendously respected as well as reviled by other prominent health influencers and popular media icons. I draw upon my extensive network of scientists, influencers, thinkers, and thought leaders to bring to you a distilled version of what I believe is the proper take on the latest new ideas and trends in these fields. I hope you enjoy the podcast. Welcome to The Kevin Bass Show. A bit about my background and a disclaimer. I have uh, nearly 20 years either studying medical science or being in a laboratory conducting medical science. Nonetheless, I am only a MD-PhD student. I'm not yet a medical doctor. And even if I was, nothing that I'm discussing here would be medical advice, simply a interpretation of the medical literature by a person who reads voraciously and thinks incessantly about how to think about scientific problems and their practical application to health. Correspondingly, you should only take this as such, and always, if you have an idea that you take from this podcast that you want to apply to your own life, you should always talk to your doctor before doing so, and never construe anything you hear as medical advice. And with that, enjoy The Kevin Bass Show. Hey everybody, welcome to The Kevin Bass Show. And in this episode, I'm going to be having on Kevin Folta. It is my great honor, in fact, to present this interview with Kevin Folta to you. Uh, Dr. Kevin Volta is a professor of horticultural sciences at the University of Florida, in fact, the former chair of the department there. He has dozens of scientific publications, hundreds of public lectures, and hundreds of weekly podcast episodes from Talking Biotech podcast, which he aims, with which he aims to communicate the latest and greatest in biotech technological science, especially with regard to horticultural and agricultural sciences. Uh, he has been in the public eye quite a bit over the last 10 years, uh, where he has really stuck his neck out to defend science uh, against a great deal of mm, obfuscation, uh, alternative health narratives about agricultural sciences we'll be talking about in this podcast, which have really misrepresented the risks and benefits of modern agricultural science and have really actually had a negative effect on policy and on the economy of, of food and food production, uh, this misinformation. Uh, people such as Vani Hari, Food Babe, and even a, 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 a really quite misrepresentational article in the New York Times have uh, opposed Kevin's influence in this space. And I think it's actually been quite a shame. And I'm hoping that some of this podcast can at least can help to correct some of that record and there's so much that we really wanted to talk about in this podcast we only had an hour and i really hope to have kevin on uh more than just this one time maybe even uh i would like to have him as an on ongoing guest because i just respect his approach and his knowledge about agricultural science to such a great degree but in this podcast and hopefully in subsequent podcasts we will be correcting some of the record of misinformation and misrepresentation of um, some of the positions that he takes, which are frankly simply the, uh, he's simply reporting the science as it pertains to some of these particular issues. And what those issues are in particular are we touch on uh, genetically modified organisms, the legacy way of producing mutations in, uh, in plants that we use for agriculture, as well as the more modern ways the risks and the benefits of each way. Uh, we talk about Roundup Ready, glyphosate, which is Monsanto now Bayer's former uh, herbicide product, which is the most um, widely used and in, in arguably the safest herbicide used in modern agriculture. We talk about uh, a recent podcast episode where Joe Rogan uh, lambastes 
Dr. Folta, and we address some of the issues on which uh, Joe might have some problem with Kevin, and, and we correct the record on some of that. And to get some of that context, you can actually look at the previous episode where I talk about Ken Folta. It should be a couple of podcasts down the list, and you can listen to that for some further context. But yeah, we uh, try to go through quite a bit of agricultural science, philosophy of science, communication, a lot of discussion about alternative health, alternative medicine, um, the h- how to gain trust of people who have alternative points of view. My own personal alternative points of view, I was once opposed to, to, to Dr. Folta's science communication myself, and how we can try to appeal to the public to best uh, communicate the full understanding of what the current science actually says. And that was one of the things that impressed me the most about talking with Kevin is that whenever I would push push back on something and try to ask him questions and drill deep down, which which is my, my pension, it's what I, I'm excited to do, it's what I'm good at, whenever I started to ask him deep questions, he was more than willing to engage with some of those potential criticisms, those potential downsides to his position. In fact, he seemed eager to do so. So eager, in fact, that I think he went beyond what he even needed to do to uh, to fully recognize some of the potentially uh, the different opinions about his particular position and I thought that that was such a, a, a I thought that's what a true scientist does so he really struck me not just as a science advocate but as a, a real authentic science scientist uh, trying to communicate science to the public in the only way that a true scientist really even should and we talk about what that means in this podcast and and all these other issues that I've just mentioned. So without any further ado, uh, welcome Dr. Kevin Fultz to the podcast. Okay, we are recording. So uh, welcome to the Kevin Bass Show, Dr. Folta. I am, I couldn't be more excited and pleased to have you on, especially for the first guest that I've ever done an interview on, given your uh, background in science communication. It's, uh, it's an honor. Well, it, it, it's uh, it's also really nice for me. It's nice to meet you in person, sort of. <laughs> um, I followed you for a long time and recommended you to others. So this is a good place to be. That um, I'm flattered to hear that uh, I wouldn't recommend me to others, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm glad that you I'm glad that you have have that amount of faith in me. Um, yeah, so I, what I what I am most curious about is how did you get involved in in trying to correct misinformation about agriculture? What is what is sort of the plot line that led you to this point? Well, the the big thing for me isn't so much a desire to correct others as much as a desire to share the beauty of science and the exciting things that are going on. And and I was addicted to science since I was a little kid. Um, My father and I sat on the couch in 1969. I was two years old and we watched the the lunar lander and all the stuff that was going on. And being two years old, I don't know that I knew what was happening, but I knew it was important because my dad made me know it was important. And I remember conversations with him about atoms and molecules uh, when I was very young, Mr. Rogers saying you could, that you're bigger than the water. And I, I always say, well, glass of water, ocean, where are we here? And we talked about atoms and we talked about molecules. And I remember those conversations. And, you know, long story short, I was from there, you know, very fortunate to have great mentors through school and supportive parents and great teachers in high school that let me take (laughs) AP classes twice if I wanted to. Um, and, And great ones in college that gave me the opportunity to work in the laboratory. So great mentorship and a lot of enthusiasm gave me that interest in science that I just want to share. And when you see people saying things that are not true, that cloud our understanding, that obfuscate the realities that we know as scientists, that that's where it's important to tap them on the shoulder and say, let me help you understand that. Um, why do you think it's important for people to have the correct understanding of, of what science says as opposed to their their false understanding? Well, I think in the beginning, if you would have asked me 20 years ago, I would say it's important because this is such cool science and we need to understand it because it's so cool that you'll love this. 
but that doesn't matter to people. The evidence doesn't matter. People who are afraid of science or afraid of new technology respond very negatively and emotionally that all the data in the world can't turn that around. But today it's a very different because you actually see the misinformation and disinformation around science resulting in a lack of application of technology. And, you know, think about it from a medical perspective. You've got a, a, a medicine in the bottle that can cure whatever, and it's been shown to be safe, and it's been shown to be effective, and you're not allowed to use it because of a government regulation. You know, the EU won't allow it because some uh, activist group says no. So it's more important now because it's affecting the poor, it's affecting the food insecure, it's affecting farmers, and it's causing higher prices for consumers. So this is why we need new technology and people to communicate what it is and isn't. So the government regulations in Europe, that's not science-based, that's influenced by activist groups. There's no scientific basis for those regulations in Europe. Well, there's scientific that basis. That you're referring to. Yeah, yeah, there's scientific basis for some of the concerns and certainly nothing is risk-free and we understand mm. what those are and we're careful about thinking about them but they augment the risks and make up a bunch more <laughs> mm. um, before they consider the potential benefits. And so the situation in Europe is abysmal and my colleagues on the other side of the pond are really upset about not being able to implement the technologies that are on the ground in China, that are on the ground in India, the technologies that are gaining traction throughout the world. And they're the ones who are going to be last to be able to use them or develop them as scientists. Yeah, before we continue on, I want to just say I agree with you about um, the, your orientation and why you think this is important. It's uh, in medicine for the same exact reasons you're talking about. We have people who've dedicated their whole careers, in fact, not just individuals, but whole groups of people, lineages of people who have built um, the scientific uh, architecture to then create a treatment that can uh, dramatically improve lives. So for example, something that I talk about and people who I follow a lot and 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 respect a lot talk about is uh, there's a lot of denialism about uh, the role of LDL cholesterol and cardiovascular disease and the use of statin medications, which are probably one of the most powerful. Uh, I mean, if you wanted to even, you could even say it's like, in using more internet, uh, trendy internet lingo, it's like one of the most powerful biohacks or most powerful longevity interventions that you could, you could possibly have. And it's just traditional medicine that uh, people are afraid of because of a fear mongering around, um, around these medications. And it's, a, and it's a tragedy really, because if more people uh, adhere to these, to these medications, we would save tens of thousands or if not hundreds of thousands of more lives than, um, than we do. And those lives are people's uh, fathers, sons, daughters, mothers. And uh, we're, we're losing that because of, of widespread skepticism, even among um, practicing physicians who are not as scientifically inclined as, as you may know, uh, to be a medical doctor, you certainly do get a lot of basic science training, but um, you may not necessarily dive in as much to the, to the hard science as um, as may, maybe a PhD scientist would, and, and, a, and a lot of medical doctors have even been influenced negatively about a lot of the misinformation around statin. statin. So it's actually sort of a human tragedy um, to, to have a misunderstanding of science in my field, and I imagine it's very similar in your field as well. So for um, the European regulations, and wh which ones are we referring to? Are we referring to uh, like genetically modified organism we're referring to glyphosate here is what are we referring to specifically well mostly the one that is most tragic is the application of gene editing technology so the newer crispr cas9 type technologies that can make discrete surgical edits in genes they've said is absolutely unacceptable and mm. these are technologies that they've employed well i i should say the products that they've used the plants that they've used have had gene edits that were made with radiation going back 50 years now. Yep. And yep. that's cool. Um, you know, to your point, just real quick to jump backwards. Um, you mentioned the issue with uh, statins and how you know, the lack of thorough understanding and acceptability through, through everywhere. But think about the, the flip side of that with insulin, because this is kind of the nexus of what you study and what I study is here's a genetically engineered vaccine, a human gene in bacteria that mm. 35 million people inject into their bodies on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. And this is not only accepted, 
it's demanded and it's necessary uh, for type one diabetics. It keeps them alive. And we don't have to go harvest insulin out of the gut piles of pancreases and slaughterhouses anymore like we did in the 70s. So this is, this is a great example of how genetic engineering and medicine can have these tremendous life extending uh, uh, consequences that are freely accepted. So our job now as communicators is how do we get everything else to that place? Sure. And in the case of of um, of uh, genetically modified organisms, you you mentioned that in the past we used radiation to cause genetic changes, or even before that, we, spontaneous genetic changes would occur. I guess presumably because of environmental radiation or other sort of mutagens that change the the uh, the germline and then cause certain characteristics to then. Um, be expressed in the in the plants, and then humans would then select those characteristics. But in those cases, um, as as I understand, because I actually used to, and this is an, another wrinkle. This is kind of a small aside, because um, but it's a it's an entertaining aside to me. Uh, I used to participate a lot in sort of like scientific discussions about biotech. Although uh, I was a troll, I was an anti like biotech troll for a long time, especially in like. I don't know if you know Food and Farm Discussion Lab yeah, yeah. Uh, on Facebook. Yeah, I was sure. banned from Food and Farm Discussion Lab on Facebook. This was like uh, six years ago before I like, this is when <laughs> I first started my uh, medical degree and I, I hadn't started the PhD yet. So I didn't have a good scientific background. Well, that um, was you? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, uh, I, I can't remember one of the uh, the admins there, but they they called me a uh, human nonsense machine uh, because I would I would come up because I'm an intelligent person. I would come up with like, endless arguments about why uh, biotech is bad because um, I was ideologically uh, opposed to it from from mm -hmm. an ideological. It was it's not natural. Um, so so that all that is to say, first of all, it's 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 been a funny and very interesting road to sort of circle back around to now talking with you and um, helping to promote uh, the correct information as opposed to the incorrect information that in some cases I used to I used to promote. So, um, but to get to the point that I was going to make, um, the radiation uh, that causes many, many non-specific mutations that have nothing to do with the genetic pathways that you're interested in. Uh, those might have untoward effects that certainly would be very difficult to characterize and quantify even with like modern science and when you go back to those days when you were actually using radiation they had far fewer scientific tools in order to figure that out in the first place <laughs> yet that was completely acceptable all these potentially uh negative con potential negative consequences that you could get um, as a result of the phenotypes that you created in these plants whereas today we can just modify very specifically in a very targeted manner, one particular gene. And um, we know exactly what that does. We've characterized that probably in models that, that um, uh, even before we've even uh, produced the, the, uh, the genetic variants that we've created, mm -hmm. then we can characterize the phenotypes much more systematically probably than we did in the past and probably under much more regulatory um, oversight. And yet people for whatever reason, despite it being much more targeted, much more specific, for whatever reason, are more opposed to this than they were to something that was completely <laughs> random in the past, which is, it's uh, kind of crazy to think about. It's because they don't have the science literacy to know that um, this natural process that happened in the past, like, is way more unpredictable than what we have now. Um, I guess people, because people watch movies, people have active imaginations. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's, it's a, it's a funny and ironic situation that we are in right now because of people's fear of technology, really, it seems like they have a fear of technology, almost like this kind of Terminator. They believe like the Terminator is going to, if we were going to create like terrible things, they watch too many anime films, maybe. Um, they have like maybe a, a vision, a vivid, terrified imagination about what these unnatural processes could do. And maybe let, let me um let me let me sort of see things from their point of view, because I can to some degree still see things from their point of view. Um the reason I imagine that they think that is there is a history though of major major corporations, right? Uh I think even including like Monsanto, um 
pharma, whenever I think of, whenever I defend like statins, whenever I defend blood pressure, medica- there's so many different things that I have to defend. Uh, but if you think about the history of the companies that made some of these, there have been scandals in the past and mm-hmm. that kind of, um, and then, and then we don't know how, exactly how they're operating. Even today, we think that maybe what they've done in the past may continue on today. They're driven by profit. They're not necessarily always driven by um, humanitarian considerations, or maybe sometimes they are, but then you have changes in leadership and so you can get corruption. So it's kind of hard to know, um, just speaking from that point of view, like it's kind of hard to know, like, yeah, maybe the scientists reassure us that these technologies are safe, but um, given this history, how how do we really know that if we don't really, if we don't really understand the science, there's kind of like a gap there because the scientists can tell us but how do we know that scientist is telling the truth? That's sort of like the conundrum, right? I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying that you have to solve this on the podcast. Maybe you, maybe you have a good answer to this. If you don't, it's okay. But it just, to me, it seems like a conundrum even for me because I don't know how to get through to people sometimes, you know, because I can feel and I understand their sort of conspiratorial worldview, but I, I struggle to get through to that because I know how they see me and I, and I don't know how to communicate in such a way that can earn their trust. You know, I feel like yeah. it's really hard to earn their to earn people's trust uh, whenever they distrust these technologies. It's it's a real big challenge. Well, you have a I lot thought. to unpack there, but I, I think <laughs> the, uh, the the big word is trust, and how do you gain that yeah. trust? And the other T word is truth. And you said you know scientists know the truth to scientists, but really I don't know that we do. I think that scientists um, we and this is bordering in the philosophy. We have the evidence. And we know the evidence and we know its strengths and we know its limitations. And any scientist who says they have the answer or this is the truth, you know, I would be a little bit suspect. I can tell you, here's what the current evidence says. And that means I can change my mind if better evidence comes along. Um, the, The more data that I have that supports a hypothesis, the harder it is to turn. Uh, harder it is to you know work me against it or or maybe there is a nuance that that does you know allow for that so i'm always very flexible i'm a data guy i'm an evidence guy and so the public doesn't operate that way <laughs> especially because the eggheads in science make sure that their uh, data and evidence are relatively inaccessible either mm-hmm. by paywalls or jargon um, that then that's where science communication comes in is that we start to be able to find the ways to earn the trust that the Monsantos and the Dows, and because you're right, you mentioned um, the indiscretions. You know, Monsanto Hmm. has super fun projects all over the U.S. from when they were a chemical company. Um, Dow Dow, um, bought Union Carbide that when I was a kid had a gas cloud of uh, um, uh, whatever this stuff was, methylene chloride, leave a factory and, and settle in a valley and suffocated thousands of people in India. You know, mm-hmm. there's a lot of blood on the hands of the corporations. Uh, Vioxx, you know, you look at the, how that whole thing unfolded. Yep. So uh, the point is the mistakes are made and problems happen and it causes an erosion of trust in those legacy companies. So it makes our job harder but what we do is we talk about the evidence and we have to talk about the bad things as well as the good things, the risk as well as the benefit. Yep. And that's the way we earn trust. Yeah. Um, man, there's so many, there's so many uh, directions we could go with this. And um, so do you think, so this is something that I've um so for, for like maybe three or four years after I kind of turned away from uh, sort of having an alt alt health point of view or an alternative health point of view, and, and I really embraced the scientific point of view. I felt very sort of betrayed by uh, sort of the alt health figures that had um, influenced me to think uh, so sort of conspiratorially, or to think of like you know these big corporations and. Uh, are, 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 are not looking after our health. They're doing bad things. Um, the, the dietary guidelines are going to be harmful for people's health. I, I felt a lot of um, misgivings about that. And I wanted people to understand how that kind of stuff was wrong and how it's like systematically wrong. In my opinion, there's, it's almost, it's not to say that there's not some important truths in there, but 
um, on the whole, uh, it's just like, there's so much that's so wrong in a lot of those figures point of view. One, one you might be familiar with is, is Vani Hari, Food Babe. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm chapter two of her book. <laughs> Oh, I think I'm chapter two or chapter three of feeding you lies. Yeah, she, she don't like me. Yeah, she she came to my university years ago, and I went and I, I listened to her for a, for a couple for an hour and a half, and uh, got in line by the microphone to start asking questions. And she said, "Thank you, good night." <laughs> <laughs> and I was so mad. And I guess you know. And then she had maybe a little Q and a with some students by the stage, but she didn't open it up to, you know, where here I was with my list. My, it was the thing where I had like the, 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 the uh, legal pad and I had, all right, number one, you know, <laughs> she just undid all of the work I did and all of the work that me and my colleagues did to educate these students on these important issues of uh, alternative health medicine, whatever, as well as engineering or genetic engineering or, or science. And but most of all, she broke from the idea of uh, the scientific method and hypothesis driven research to here's what I think. And if I think this, this is my reality and my heart. And so here's where it goes. And no evidence, no data, just, you know, a a compelling speaker, uh, persuasive. Um, she, everything about her is, is, is good. And I would love to see her on the side of science. Right now, I don't know what she's doing, but. Uh, but but to your point, that getting folks to break away from the claims that are made because they feel good and follow this much more rigorous pathway of hypothesis-driven science isn't easy. And it's much more easy to buy some uh, you know bottle of stuff online and say, this is going to help my memory, um, rather than really looking at the, the basic causes of, of any kind of problem. And so I'm going to flip the table on you real quick. What was it that made you change? from one to the other. I just had time to think. I had time to think. And also there was a specific, um, I'm not gonna reveal the, con the exact contents of it, but there's a specific communication between, I'm not even gonna reveal the person, <laughs> me and a major, cause I just, I mean, it was said in confidence. And even if uh, I disagree with this person, I think what this person said to me was, was wrong. Um, when I talk to people on the other side and they say stuff to me in confidence that uh, is terrible, um, I still don't, I don't, I, I think it's like my ethical duty not to, not to reveal that. Sure. Um, Cause I also, I don't want to like destroy trust completely with people who, uh, and like have people not like want to talk to me at all. I feel like that's mm -hmm. just a bad thing. And, and scoring that small kind of point by just saying it, it's not going to, make any difference in anybody's mind or maybe it's not going to be that big a deal. I'd rather cold. I'd rather um, emphasize the human relationships over mm -hmm. sort of the, so, so, well, but, 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 but let one, me jump on, let me just mention under that. Cause I, you know, and I hate to take over your show, <laughs> but, yeah, 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 but, cool. but, 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 but let me give you a quick thought on that is that you're doing the right thing. And that it, that those folks who are spreading misinformation, a lot of them are, uh, have, have a um, malevolent, angle and they're mm. out this for money or ideology but a lot of them have just been misled themselves and if we break that chain by pissing them off or or throwing them under the bus we lose the opportunity to foster their change and so you know hopefully yeah. that's the situation you're in yeah no um that's that, that, there's so much there uh but I'll, I'll try to there's so much i could respond to there and i'll try to <laughs> try to uh we keep we're going on we're, we're on tons of this is a really interesting conversation but i feel like there's this these massive tree of different topics that would be great to go on um but uh with with this person they told me something that about something that they wrote that was dishonest um and I, and I do believe this person believes what they're doing a hundred percent, but I believe they're, I believe they're a little loose with the facts and that's part of the reason why they can continue to do it, even though they believe in it. That's kind of like, they don't, 
if they really dove into the details, eventually things would start to break apart. It's sort of like being able to not dive into the details allows the whole thing to stay together. Uh, but this person told me something that was, that was really bad. Some, their editor told them to put something into their book that was that they knew was wrong because it would be provocative. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and, I, and, and at that point, I stopped talking to that person. I had been corresponding with that person quite a lot. And, and, and had really admired that person until that point. Cause, cause like, once you start like compromising your integrity for like your editor, so you can get book sales, it just seems wrong to me. Um, so then I started to really kind of that, that relationship breaking a little bit kind of really got me started to think more critically, um, about things. Uh, and start to like look at the details myself, like, okay, what, it, what could be wrong with this kind of stuff, as opposed to what do I agree with? And how, how does this make me uh, affirmed in my, my beliefs? Um, and I agree with you completely about cultivating good relationships with people. It's quite hard, actually, though, doing what we're doing, because a lot of them take things personally, if you, if you debunk them. Uh, but I do think that we should... Uh, really emphasize less of an antagonistic and hostile point of view. And, and that's one of the things that when I started reading about your background before we started talking, it's like, I, I really liked that, that that was your emphasis. And I think that is the way. Um, if you read my YouTube comments, like I, I have done a lot of debunkings and I still do them sometimes. Uh, it's just like, tons of people coming in and telling me I'm the worst person in the world. And I just like, I, I want to figure out how to get through to people in a more like, so that they don't think that, uh, but it's, it's challenging. And, and this gets to, again, we can, we're basically getting back recursively into the discussion. Um, this gets into what you mentioned about telling both sides of the story. So we can talk about the benefits, but it's also good to be open about the risks about the downsides, but that's a little bit of a disadvantage. And one of the, the thoughts I had whenever I heard that, that popped into my head was like Luke Skywalker talking with Yoda and he asks, is the dark side stronger? And, and he says, no, but I think he says something, it's faster, uh, it's more seductive. Uh, this I think was in the swamp scene. And I think that is, <laughs> that is our critical problem. What Yoda said is like the dark side is faster and more seductive. It is, it's black and white. It's uh, you get to the point, you get to the, like the view that you're supposed to get to very quickly. And um, because of that, it's, it really um, sort of, I think it tantalizes our lizard brain, our primal brain, our, 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 our need to believe in something very solid and simple. Um, whereas science, which with its, with its whole bunch of nuances, with its risks, with its benefits, with its unknowns even, um, with this idea that I'm always open to update my point of view, I'm going to say, for example, that glyphosate is incredibly safe. Um, it improves dramatic you know, improves people's lives dramatically by increasing uh, the efficiency of agriculture, et cetera. You could say all that, but then you can always just say, well, I'm also open to, to, um, to, to, to revising that point of view. And once you say that, then people are like, well, is it, is it certain or not? But then the other side will always say things are certain. So for scientists, we have kind of a problem with human nature a little bit because science kind of goes against some uh, like, I think some really strong drives within human nature to 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 have like a simple view of the world uh, of black and white, good and evil. And science is much more complicated. Science in that way, being trained to be a science scientist is almost like being trained to think in a way that isn't necessarily super not super like particularly natural for people to think. It's an unnatural way uh, in some respects. There is a scientific way of thinking that is a part of all people's thinking for sure like and it goes back before we even have modern science being very critical very very thoughtful and etc but it's but it's also um not jumping to conclusions and then sort of holding back and always being trying to challenge that's a very particular way of thinking that most people don't naturally gravitate to and so when we fight uh misinformation with science we're at kind of an inherent disadvantage it's we're a little bit slower and less seductive than the dark side and i i find that to be also 
I'm just pointing that out. I don't know if you have anything to say about that. Uh, misinformation is very. Uh... <laughs> yeah, no, it, no, it, but what you framed is a very simple, it is a is a complicated issue that we can boil down to something simple. Is that those who wish to misinform have the ability to exploit emotion and drive the limbic system, yeah. which causes yeah. us to make yeah. a lot of quick decisions. And those of us who appeal to science are talking about risks and benefits and weighing nuances, yeah. and that's an executive function. And so you're talking about this battle between emotion and executive function, cerebral cortex against limbic system. And this kind of battle is something that made us very successful as humans because before the year 1900, emotional decisions were very helpful. <laughs> you know, that that don't see what's rustling in the bushes. You know, yeah. don't pick on the big guy. Don't, you know, these were the things that were, that helped us. It, with science and with more information became this weirdness to have to dissect the nuances. And this is stuff that Dan Kahneman has talked about in the book, Thinking Fast and Slow, that, you know, here we are as scientists trying to win an emotional argument with um, data and facts, and it doesn't work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, that's the dilemma. Yeah, th this is, yeah, how do we do that? I don't know how to do that. I just keep trying. I just keep communicating and I win over some people, but, but it's hard, man. Like, it's slow. It's hard. It's, it's, it's uncommon that I do win over people, but I do, it does happen. And it's, mm -hmm. it's a, it's a great feeling when people, and I'm, I'm sure you've had this happen to you thousands of times All when people time. message you. <laughs> and then they say like, I thought this one way, but now I'm seeing differently. And that's a great feeling, but man, it feel, certainly feels like the, like the large mass of people. I, I don't know. It's pretty just, um, discouraging some, I, but I don't know what else we're supposed to do. So I'm going to keep doing it because <laughs> It's like the only thing that's, it's like one of the only things that's really worth doing um, for me. So, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, it's a tough, it's a tough situation. I had another. But, but, oh, but it's about, but it's yeah. about trust. It's about gaining trust. And people yeah. are misinformed because they listen to trusted figures who are giving bad information. We have to find ways to get into these, un, these groups that we maybe are not customarily associated with and earn trust. It's tough to do. And Super hard. these. And these other groups yeah. or these social tribes find ways to insulate themselves from new information coming in that's contrary to the to the vibe. Look at the political divides. You know, there there's so many ways in which this breaks down. So that's what I've dedicated my time to is how do we earn trust? And the folks who want me out of the conversation find ways to take that trust away. And mm -hmm. so this is a really important dynamic, and this is the battle that we're in. So I want to I want to help to add some trust here by pointing out that uh, before you came on to talk with me, uh, you mentioned that you had been, uh, and I think every time we've tried <laughs> to set up this podcast, the the uh, twenty five times we've tried to set this up, uh, you've been doing farm work. But this one time in particular, you had been wrestling with turkeys. Um, so I want to like I want to let the listeners know that uh, he does. He actually. You, it, it sounds like you do a lot of farm work. And um, do you want to tell us some about that? Because that is also very interesting. That you, on the one hand. Um, you know, you're a, you're, you're a scientist who talks a lot about biotech. I mean, your podcast is called Talking Biotech, but you're also involved in uh, farming on your own land. Is that what, is that some, that? Yeah, is that yeah, right? yes. So it's super cool. Um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a scientist who uh, works in biotechnology, uh, who, who, you know, we didn't even talk about my research work, which is all in either how we think about light and plant development and the chemistry of flavors and aromas and all that good stuff. But Mm -hmm. um, my, uh, when I come home from work, I get to go to work and I love it. Uh, my wife is a full-time farmer and we have acreage in Archer, Florida. We're outside of Gainesville where we do small crop fruits and vegetables, specialty crops, uh, meaning fruits and vegetables that, um, things that have short shelf lives that we can deliver that most people can't. And we raise heritage breed livestock. So we raise turkeys. It's coming up to Thanksgiving and we had wing clipping day today and, they're out running in the field. We had to get them put away and they don't like necessarily going where they're supposed to go. So we turn out the light, we run around under the moonlight and catch turkeys and get whacked with wings and pecked and, but we get them back where they're going. And, but, um, and then tonight when we're done, I get to go plant avocados and it's what nine 30 at night. Um, and, oh my gosh. and, uh, and I got to have them for tomorrow morning for uh grafting work. So, 
but but you know what it's a lot of fun and uh and it adds to the authenticity of what i do when i talk to groups about genetic engineering and they you know talk about small farms and the dangers and it's like wait a minute i'm a small farmer you know it's what i do when i'm not doing the professor thing and i get it and here's how it can help you and so those kind of common grounds are the things we need to be forging more of yeah, that's why also I like, I sometimes like to look like a meathead, like I look right now, you know, <laughs> because the meatheads will think, hey, maybe he knows what like he's talking about, you know, I don't, you know, I don't care about these randomized control trials, but like, how much does he bench press? How much does he deadlift? You know, if he can deadlift, <laughs> yeah, he probably knows what he's talking about. So <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, so, yeah, okay, okay. How much time do we have left? How much time is good for you? Well, it's good if I, it's good if we if we put a lid on it at an hour, and then we can always pick up some other time. Okay, I got I got to um, grab dinner and then run down the street. So, cool, cool. So, so um, at ten your time is good. yeah, that'd be awesome. Okay, cool. Um, so let's talk about uh, risks and benefits because this is like this is actually the main reason uh, when I was going back and forth with you a little bit online, um, whenever you mentioned that you were excited to talk about both the risks and the benefits, then I knew at that point that you were legit, at least the way that I think about science, I'm like built like this. Like I always think that um, there's always a positive side and a negative side. That is what an intervention is. That's what any action in the world is. Every action in the world has a positive side and a negative side. You do something, there's a downside to the action and a, and, a, and a positive side to the action. And the same goes with any sort of technology. And so when some science communicators like to only emphasize the positive sides and then they don't emphasize the negative sides, that actually loses my trust personally because I'm thinking, oh, this person is just trying to promote this idea and they're not interested in like maybe what the truth is because the truth includes the negative side. So, so I was really excited whenever you mentioned that you were, you were um, it's almost sounded like you were excited to talk about the negative sides too, because I, I want to hear everything. And so do you, uh, one of the things that we thought we might talk about is glyphosate. Are you interested in talking about that? Oh, sure. Yeah. Anytime I, I follow the glyphosate liver, literally 30 years. Oops, did I lose you there? Can you hear me now? Ah, my, yes. you know what? My, yes. my, my connection is, it says my interconnection is unstable. Ooh. So how's that doing? Is that good now? It's, it's going now. It's going yeah, now. It's going yeah. Now. I, mean, I'm, I'm, I live out in the country. It's always weird. Um, no you know, birds set on the, <laughs> <laughs> on the, on the cable line. Yeah. Yeah. I'm happy to talk about glyphosate. It's something I've studied for 30 years. I, I literally have kept on top of that literature uh, since the, uh, since the early nineties. And, and I think I've read almost every paper. Yeah, and 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 uh, recently Joe Rogan was pretty angry about you. He thought that you're a uh, <laughs> he thinks you're a, a, like a Monsanto shill, and um, and he thinks uh, and and like the latest studies. I think there's like I think they're French studies or whatever they are. There there's studies that are showing like that everybody has like one part per billion or one, whatever oh, yeah. mm -hmm. glyphosate in their blood, and he thinks well. I think this is almost quoting him verbatim. He says, well, nobody should have any of that poison. Nobody should have any of that. And it's just like, that is so disturbing. I mean, it's like, I just want to like, ugh, yeah. like, like, but, but you know, the good dude. And, and I was on his show years ago and, and, and I, you know, and I, we really hit it off. We had a great time. You can listen yeah. to the podcast. Yeah. I think it was six, five or something. And we had a great conversation. It was really nice. And we left as friends and it was great. We look forward to the next time. But he, ever since then, he's been really surrounded by folks who are telling a very different yeah. story. Yeah. And yes, glyphosate, you know, this chemical is extremely safe. Uh, as far as, let me just say, not safe, but low risk, very low risk in terms of health. Yes. Um, it goes yep. right through you. It's, it's water soluble and mm -hmm. it's lost in urine and stools. So when you test the other thing that's happened is when you have a controversial chemistry and the Monsanto company who devised this com compound, 750 different formulations are available now from dozens and dozens of different companies. So it's way off patent. It's not just Monsanto. The chemists know how to find it. 
know how to detect it at the edge of nothing, literally at yeah. the edge of nothing. So uh, you can detect parts per trillion, which is seconds in 32,000 years. Yeah. Think about that for a second. I mean, that is, that is awesome. And so when you look at the year of people who live in areas where glyphosate is used, which is everywhere because municipalities use it, schools use it, residents use it, residential use is high. You're always going to detect a few parts per billion, so seconds in 32,000 years in urine, because that's where it should be. It goes through you. It comes in. Maybe there's a little bit of residue on uh, on some cornstarch or a little bit of residue on, on some sugar beets or whatever. Yep. The tiny little bits that's there. Yep. And, and you can detect that. Yep. But from the side of the yep. consumer, they didn't ask for it. You know what I'm saying? They, so to the consumer, you can see why this looks like a problem. And then you mm. add on top of this, these lawsuits, which have been really manufactured yes. controversies by law yep. firms to cash a check. Now all yep. of a sudden people it's not there biologically so that's really the problem I, th I think it's caught up again. Okay. I think it, oh, good, good, good. Okay. Yeah. Okay. The, you know, the other thought, you know, you might want to, if you ever tried Zencaster. Zencaster, that's a good idea. Yeah. I know yeah. Uh, I've done that a couple of times. Not, not yeah. some other people have done it with me. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. nice because it records locally and then uploads. And so you don't lose anything because of bandwidth differences. But I, I think just for your editing purposes, you know, I'll just say that the, the you know, glyphosate has been uh, something where science has not seen it as very controversial, yet it has been grabbed onto as a proxy for genetic engineering because it's used with genetic right. crops. Right, right, yep, and yeah, and, and that's part of, yes, that's kind of the ideological um, objection to glyphosate. It's almost because it's, it's linked in some way, it's almost like, so therefore it's like kind of justified to attack it, even if the evidence is not even, I wouldn't even call the evidence thin that's harmful. It's like non-existent that it's harmful at the doses at which consumers are going to, to get it. So um, we get these parts per, 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 per billion, parts per trillion detections in consumers. But if you look at any study that's been conducted in, I think even in cells like the, but in cells in in rodents and i've i've actually looked at like some of the reports that looked at the very large rodent studies the many many rodent studies that have been conducted the toxicological studies where they do dose responses um chronic feedings over over i think the life lifetimes of the animals until they sacrifice the animals um for months at least there's the levels at which uh, you get toxicity are like thousands of times higher than these, if not thousands, maybe even millions of millions. times higher than these. Yeah. Then, and, and that's like the, the lower limit to start just seeing something to start seeing yeah. just something like yeah. a weight change or like some change in physiological function, like millions of times higher. So it's not even detectable. Um, um and, well, and yet yeah well let me put it in context is that you know a recent paper came out where they talk about well it's in the brain it's crossing the blood brain barrier and i looked very carefully at the paper and what it says is that someone my size 210 pounds uh so let's say 100 kilograms would have to consume 200 aspirin sized tablets of pure glyphosate every day for two weeks to get an equivalent dose to what that rat got who got the, the stuff in the brain. And, and on top of that, the one that got a quarter of that dose showed almost no symptoms. So you have to massively poison something with an herbicide before you're starting to see any kind of indications. And, and so that really reinforces your point.
Yeah. I mean, uh, caffeine is more toxic. Salt is more toxic. You know, if you, if you gave people lower doses of salt, then you would need uh, of glyphosate to be toxic. You'd actually like die sooner of the salt or of the caffeine than you would have glyphosate. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's incredible. It's because it's, uh, it's, it's, it's incredible that it's just kind of, it's kind of frustrating. Like if people understood this, I, I feel like, um, it would be great if people understood this. So, well, look at, but look at the relative risk of, of a compound like alcohol, where they were. Mm. And this is oh, yeah. the one that oh, yeah. this is the one that always made me laugh because they would say in a, in a, they found glyphosate in wine at five parts per billion, <laughs> and I would say okay, but there's uh, and that's and that is a supposed probable carcinogen, right? At five parts mm -hmm. per billion. There's mm -hmm. a known carcinogen, yes. a known carcinogen at 1330 million parts per billion. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know what? We like it. Mm, yeah. So it, yeah. it really frames yeah. the risk. Yeah. Yeah. And you can detect that at the population level. You can detect that like that's really rigorously shown that alcohol is probably the cause of, of like I guess millions of deaths worldwide every year. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Sure. It's like, yeah, it's a lot. Sure. Uh, whereas glyphosate might be. Okay. So, okay. So let's ask, so let's go steel man though. The, the, the other side um, it's probably not. Okay. Let me ask you this question. Maybe before I do that, what about the microbiome effects? Shikimate pathway. Is there anything there? I mean, we've seen, I think it's, they found it in, I don't know, they in bacterial cultures or something. Um, well, uh is there yeah. any in vivo? Is there any suggestion of any in vivo data that it that it might have any health impact? On, yes. On uh, yeah. So yeah. Let, let's jump backwards for the listener. The reason that this herbicide works is because it disrupts a specific enzyme that is involved in the manufacture of amino acids, which are the building blocks of proteins, and it works great because the plant basically um, can't make any of the parts it needs to survive, so it dies. That's why it's an herbicide. But a lot of plant genes are very similar to what is found in some bacteria, and especially some of these plastid-based me uh, metabolic genes. And uh, they figured, well, maybe some bacterial genes are affected. And if bacterial genes are affected, we're loaded with bacteria. So glyphosate may inhibit the act same activity in the gut microbiome. Here's the problem, <clears throat> is that two things. One is that we've worked with glyphosate and bacteria in the laboratory, and it is very hard to get it into a cell without some sort of other chemical to help drag it in. Mm -hmm. So without these surfactants, these uh, amphipathic molecules that allow it to be able to usher that into the cell. So mm -hmm. one is that the small amounts that are there, those parts per billion, they're not there with a surfactant. And those would be have a very hard time getting into the cell. The second part is pure stoichiometry. If you study chemistry, if you've got a part per billion of a chemical that's right, present, right. how can that have any effect when you have trillions of bacteria in, in the gut and the chemicals being turned over and the chemicals being excreted? And even if it gets into a cell, it can inhibit one enzyme. You've got how many hundreds of yeah. thousands, millions of enzymes that are doing the job. So yeah. if you drink a gallon of, of concentrated glyphosate, yes, you will likely inhibit microbiome, but it isn't going to happen from the little wisp of stuff that comes in on a Triscuit. Right. It's like, it's like taking uh, an antibiotic, but instead of taking like the normal dose it's taking like a millionth of the dose, you're not going to see any yeah. uh, clinical effect whatsoever. The it's homeopathic not. dose. Right. <laughs> Yes. Okay. Right. It, okay. It's such a small amount that's there that you can't possibly, it, it can't possibly affect biology in any meaningful way. Got it. Got it. And, and just uh, so the listeners know, uh, as a medical student, I completely endorse this. This makes total sense. Like, um, just, just, I mean, I'm sure that, I mean, so yeah, like the enzyme kinetics would need to be, um, disrupted by a higher concentration than than what glyphosate provides that makes total sense uh yeah, yeah. we can so, draw the michaelis menton uh yep yep <laughs> no yep. but but, but it, it is it's a competitive inhibitor it blocks yep. the ability of, of of the precursor for for aromatic amino acids and and it's 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 a classic case of enzymology 
But once this thing is bound, it binds pretty tight. It's pretty good. That's why it kills plants. But you got to have enough of it there. Yeah. 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 Okay. So what about what about with the adjuvants present? Like what if what if you're a farm worker? What what about that whole leap? Yeah. Because I've talked to uh, I think Brian Matheson. I go back and forth with sure. him sometimes on Twitter about the the trials going on, and he has a really good understanding of the toxicology. Um, I don't I don't really understand the the cases that are going on with the legal stuff, but his take on it is that it's uh, that basically Bayer is losing because um, it's fighting the legal fight wrong. It's not doing yeah. the the right job from a legal point of view and it has nothing to do with the science that's right is that your take absolutely yeah, okay yeah yeah, yeah. And brian's really good i really like him on twitter I, i've never met him personally but he's a wealth of information but but yeah they're they're fighting the wrong fight here uh they're trying to they're trying to win an emotional argument with with evidence mm. and i don't know that that's the way to go um mm. really when you're looking at occupational exposure to the surfactant and and the uh chemistry yeah. itself it still is at an incredibly low level and at a level that is designed to penetrate membranes in plants not necessarily going to do much much of anything in humans and or in animals in general so you know why there is more risk for occupational exposure that's where epidemiological data are so important and yeah. when you look across broad epidemiological studies like they've done for you know 20 30 years now even longer um, the best cohort analyses where they've really looked carefully at uh, people in similar situations, you see very vague associations at best, and maybe and most of the time, no associations. But it was these slight suggestions, mostly coming from, uh, from uh, case control studies, uh, that suggested that maybe something was there, but the better studies didn't, didn't support that. So based on your understanding of the mechanisms, the, the basic biology, do you think that there might be anything to those studies that find a slight association? I, I, you know, the only thing that I can think of, and this is, you know, the, when I, if I say, okay, I'm going to play along here and go with it, mm, is that yeah. there could be some sort of genetic vulnerability that some segment of the population has. So let's say, you know, one out of every 10 people has a slightly higher genetic variant for uh, uh, the development of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, you know, mm -hmm. all right, that they've already made five of the six steps that take, you know, that uh, are in the progression for one of these, you know, uh, types of lymphomas that all of a sudden, you know, this has a higher likelihood of happening in them. Yeah. You wouldn't see it pervasively with every user, but you might see it in a subset of users. And that could be true. And I yeah. think that's something that we'll continue to look at and science will continue to unravel. But at this point, there's no evidence of that. Do you, uh, but is it, cons is, uh, is it carcinogenic at a high enough dose? Uh, there's no evidence of carcinogenicity. The only studies that were identifying carcinogenicity or at least cellular transformation in vitro. So looking at it in, in, in uh, or actually the ones in vivo too, they were really, really either small studies or highly okay. suspect in their methods that mm -hmm. you look at um, comparing uh, uh, cells from two groups that were harvested in two very different scenarios, transported differently. I mean, it was, those papers are just a disaster. Yeah. Yet the IARC was very happy to include them in their analysis. So I, I'm not, I don't have a lot of confidence in those. Okay. Yeah. So, so even the studies that do show carcinogens, they've been and then there's also much better studies, much more rigorous studies with large numbers of animals. And um, I'm, I'm assuming also in vitro studies that have shown like no effect, like right. no, right. Yeah, right. And, and the ones that have been, so some of the, the famous one being the Seralini study of 2012, um, that was- The great Seralini study, it was a, yes. A train wreck. Um, the, the EU spent $15 million trying to reproduce that work in an mm. appropriate set of experiments. Yeah. And three independent ex sets of experiments, three independent sets of researchers could not repeat those, ex those findings. And when I've asked them, you know, you want to be on the podcast, you want to talk about it. They all say, I don't want to talk about it. I don't oh want to Because here were research laboratories that dedicated, you know, 10% of their research career <laughs> to testing what we knew was already BS. And, uh, you know, what do the postdocs who worked on that project publish? And where do they take their careers? You know, we showed that something we knew wasn't harmful 
uh, wasn't harmful. And so, you know, the, the, the effects of those uh, <laughs> right. original kind of BS studies are really uh, pervasive. Yeah, it's terrible. It's like, um, what is the, uh, the, what is the, um, the adage? I can't remember. It's, uh, it takes, yes. you know, yep. an, an order of magnitude more to debunk bullshit than to, than to generate it. Yeah. It's, uh, it's terrible. Or 10, or 10 times. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But what do you do with Seralini papers? Let's say you have, let's say you have your, just out of curiosity, if, if you're, a, a um, I don't know. Do you, do you just, just, should all journals just refuse to publish that kind of work? For, no, no, for... no, but they publish away. I mean, if you can find uh, people who are willing to publish that stuff, I, I, I was really for the retraction before I was against it. Um, I, I really kind of waffled on this because yeah. it, I, I think that the place to have the conversation is in the peer reviewed literature, but at the same okay. time, at the same time, we can't forget. And this is the problem. The original paper from Seralini grabbed the headlines. It was, it was everywhere. It, it made Kenya stop yeah. de developing GE crops, but the papers that came out to test it and verify got no airplay. There was no, yeah. not even a whisper. And so it's our job as communicators to take those Seralini rats and hold them up and say, Hey, remember this? It wasn't true. That was 10 years ago. This was either falsified data or data that was done so horribly that don't ever trust it. Yeah. And yet those damn three rats will show up on every single protest and every single anti-GMO website, even to this day. So you think that the responsibility really lies with science communicators. And, and I, I, can't, uh, find, I can't really disagree with you because I think that it would be a terrible thing if the, uh, the scientific publishing process became uh influenced by oh but what will the what will happen if the public because because that's a slippery slope and i think that that's sure. not where we want to take science that's but right. at the same time it's it's also a big ask and and but again i think i'm on the same side as you i'm just pointing out though it's like it's also a big ask like how are we going to do this how are we going to handle you know the 10 years after the seralini papers when it's you know, it's like the damage has been done and how do we prevent that kind of damage from happening again? And how do we deal with that situation? Do we have yeah. the, the institutions in place to properly deal with that now? And, I, and my, 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 uh, my guess would be that we'd still, if there's another Seralini type event, it can still negatively affect things. So we have to figure out a way, I don't know how we're going to do this, but we have to figure out a way to, to, to deal with this kind of thing better. And, and, and if we don't, it's, it's, it's a sad situation. So that's all I'll say. Well, we have to get journalism or journalists, legitimate science journalists, excited about the idea of reporting the failures of the sensational stories. Yeah. And this is important yeah. because even today, they still gravitate towards the sensational. Um, that rat study where if you poison rats for two weeks, they have some glyphosate in the brain. That ran with uh, across the media as glyphosate causes Alzheimer's disease. It didn't show that. Um, what we need people yeah, to do is yeah, have yeah. the balls to say, 10 years ago, we said this was going to kill all of you. And guess what? We were wrong. Yeah. Yeah. And they need and, to take responsibility, but and, they don't want to. They don't they don't want to. They have no incentive to do that. They have every incentive not to do that, because if they take responsibility, then people then they might say, well, people aren't going to trust us as much. And honestly, they should take that hit. Right. Yeah. They should take that hit. And once they start taking that hit and and either they do it on their own accord or somebody forces them to take that hit, then they'll stop doing that. They'll stop playing that game. Yeah. But, but, but let's go even one further, Kevin. And we were talking about um, trust. People don't trust the media. And the reason they don't trust the media is because they put three tumor filled rats up on the screen yeah. and say, this is just going to be you. Jeez. And for, yeah. them, for them to step back and say, we made a mistake. And we should have never have done this. And the science is pretty settled. And here's where we got it wrong. Imagine how their stock would increase. Yeah. And, you know, and this is yeah. a whole topic for another episode. Yeah. yeah but the idea is, here is, is yeah. that, that, you know, here the media made a mistake and they could correct it and, and actually gain some traction. And so when, when, when I'm the guy who has to publish the 10 year anniversary of Seralini 
and of, of those rats. And I'm the only one who did it. <laughs> and, and people were saying on Twitter, you know, the, this was talking biotech uh, 368 or 367. People were commenting, why is it that this, you know, half-assed, semi-marginally relevant scientist has to be the one to tell the story? You know, where are the journalists? And, and uh, you know, and I, I, I agree. Not yeah. my job. Yeah. Um, man, there's so much else I would love to talk to you about. I know you need to get to, to dealing with your avocado plants. Um, yeah, I have a billion other questions and, and hopefully we can have you on some other time to, to have a part two sometime, because I think this was a really cool conversation. And in some ways we just really only, uh, got our feet wet, but, uh, yeah, I thank you yeah. so much. Yeah. I thank you so much for having you. This is everything I thought it would be because, I, I had a feeling um, talking to you that you're, you know, you're a real sci you're a real scientist. So um, it's been great. Oh, I'm, I'm a pinata of information. Now, the, the, the funny thing is, is that over, uh, you know, I started in science, you know, when I, from birth, but I've been in the laboratory since 1987 and I've been kind of science evangelizing the whole way. And, uh, and I've taken a lot of arrows because of that. And we've never, we didn't even touch on that stuff. Yeah. So, but this is the point is, is that it, it's beautiful stuff. We got great technology and our future will def be defined by how well we as communicators get that yeah. technology into the hands of people. And that's where we need to go. So thank you for well, doing this. Well, we need to really hold the journalists feet up to the fire. I think that's our next uh, task is, you know, they need to take responsibility too. You know, it's yeah, us, but, but, but also... Yeah. But, but but see, this is the point. You're here doing a pod, <laughs> you're doing a podcast, right? And yeah. you know, like uh, like my buddy Jello Biafra said, if you don't like the media, become the media. Sure. And yeah. and so this yeah. is this is yeah. what happens when you don't trust the the people who are supposed to be the best storytellers. Is you spawn a new generation of storytellers, and we gain the trust of of people because we're. It turns out that. You know, here I was screaming about the Seralini rats in 2012 and about Vani Ari in 2012 and people calling me the shill and the loser and the and and who's standing today. You know, the yeah. data showed that I yep. was right. Yeah. Well, it I sounds it like, long. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, it sounds like what we're doing is something very similar to what uh, Joe Rogan is doing. So we're all in the same, you know. Cause, because, you know, it's kind of a joke, uh, but it's also serious. Like he's, his, his whole thing is that um, legacy media is not truthful about a lot of things. And so it's funny that it sounds so much like what we're, uh, what we're also, and it's true. It's, it's, that's so interesting. Yeah. 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 So hopefully you have your book and then your chapter two will be about uh, food babe. So. <laughs> no, you know what? She's not that important, and and yeah. that's the sad part. And and yep. I, I I would I would I never met her. I will. I've I've written her the nicest letters. She's mm. foiled me. She has a hundred thousand pages of my emails. She's written horrible things about me. Said horrible things about me. She uh, got on Infowars and uh, threw me under the bus. And, you know, when, when, <laughs> and that's the best part is that here's the person who's the alleged authority who has to go on info wars you know, <laughs> to, to, to share her messaging about science. Right. Uh, and, and, and throw the marginally relevant scientist in Florida under the bus. Um, and, and so, yeah, we, we, we could go on forever, but yeah, it, we're, I'll we, stop. We, a, we absolutely <laughs> do have to do this again because there's so much yeah, more to this, talk about. So I, we will, we will over the next year have another 25, um, you know, scheduled meetings and then, and then come up with something. <laughs> next time I'll wear a tie and I won't look like I fell off a turnip truck. I, I didn't know it was going to be a video thing. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm worn out from a long, long day today, but uh, it's, it happens to be a Sunday. We don't like the timestamp podcast usually, you know, we want them to be evergreen, but it's uh, for me, 10 something on a, on a Sunday and, uh, I'm going to eat some shrimp tacos and go back to work. So good times. But thank you very much, Kevin. It was really nice to talk to you. Thanks, Kevin. Appreciate it. All, All right. right. Good stuff, man. Take care. I'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Please check me out on patreon.com 
at Kevin and Bass, where you can donate and make this podcast possible. Also, check me out on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, where you can find my latest thoughts on the latest controversies and findings within health science. Also, check me out at The Kevin Bass Show, both on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and YouTube. I hope this podcast was useful to you. If it was, please leave me a five-star review on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. See you guys in the next episode.